left at uh, verification number two which is authenticator life cycle so this is OWASP application security verification standard number four or version number four and I'm actually going to go through so as an intro intro I'm actually gonna go over it in a couple of videos so that penetration testers do have some sort of a formal methodology when they're actually looking into or when they're actually performing penetration tests so that being said let me full screen here on my tablet and i'm what i want to say is that i'm actually going to fast forward through some of these sections such as the uh, authenticator life cycle which may not be as important as others. So I'm gonna flash forward through some of those that I do not consider are really important. So let's actually see before, let's give authenticator lifecycle the benefit of the doubt when it comes to importance. Authenticators are passwords, soft tokens, hardware tokens, and biometric devices. The lifecycle of authenticators is critical to the security of an application. Let's see. So if anyone can self-register an account with no evidence of identity, there can be little trust in the identity assertion. Okay, for social media sites like Reddit, that's perfectly okay. For banking systems, such as L3, level of verification, a great focus on the registration and issuance of credentials and devices is critical to the security of the application. Passwords are not to have a maximum lifetime or be subject to password rotation. Passwords should be checked for being breached, not regularly replaced. That's really important and that's a very, very good point. So there have been applications that I've tested and they require the user to rotate their passwords every so often but it would be a better idea if some of the passwords are checked for being breached, which if I come to think of it, might not be so easy to implement without actually revealing the password itself or without actually, you might be doing it in a hashing sort of way or there might be implementations to it that I'm not aware of. So let's see what the verifications are. Two, three, one, verify uh, system generated initial passwords or activation codes should be securely randomly generated, should be at least six characters long and may contain letters and numbers and expire after a short period of time. These initial secrets must not be permitted to become the long-term password. So this applies to L1, L2, L3 levels of verification. Verify that enrollment and use of uh, user-provided authentication devices are supported, such as U2F and FIDO tokens. Verify that renewal instructions are sent with sufficient time to renew time-bound authenticators, which actually translates to the fact that if you have a renewal instruction, that's actually sent to your email and the timer is 15 seconds that might not be sufficient time for you to check the email copy the token and paste it in whatever field you have to paste it into so <laughs> this this should be done logically and it might not be obvious for a penetration tester when you're actually testing situations like this one but this could be not necessarily a security issue but a good practice when building an application from a security standpoint now let's talk about something more interesting and more important credential storage architects and developers should adhere to this section when building or refactoring code this section can only be fully verified using source code review or through secure unit or integration tests. Penetration testing cannot identify any of these issues. So this actually means that to be able to 
appropriately verify credential storage, you not only have to have access to the source code, but let's say, for example, that you're testing a mobile application, and this is often the situation. When you're verifying credential storage, there are situations and there have been poor practices when I've seen credentials being stored not only unsecurely, not only stored on the device, but they were stored unsecurely on the device. So if you are doing a penetration test, they say that penetration tests cannot identify any of these issues. Well, it depends on what you're defining as being a penetration test. Because, for example, if you're someone like me in a penetration test, if I'm testing a mobile application, I'm also going to look into the source code and I'm also going to look into what's, in, what's stored on the device. I'm not only going to test the application from a dynamic networking perspective, but I'm also going to do static code analysis and I'm also going to do storage analysis and device analysis. The list of approved one-way key derivation functions, blah, blah, blah. This section cannot be penetration tested, so controls are not marked as L1. Okay, so allow me to disagree. However, this section is of vital importance to the security of credentials if they are stolen. So if forking the ASPS for an architecture or code guideline or source code review checklist, please place these controls back to L1 in your private session. Okay, so... It is what it is. Verify that passwords are stored in a form that is resistant to offline attacks. Passwords shall, sh, shall be salted and hashed using an approved one-way. So notice the pun intended. Using an approved one-way key derivation or password hashing function. Key derivation and password hashing functions Take a password, a salt, and a cost factor as input when generating a password hash. So salting is really important, not only in your diet, but also when it comes to appropriate storing of passwords offline. Verify that the salt is at least contains iodine, is at least 32 bits in length and be chosen arbitrarily to minimize salt value collision among stored hashes. For each credential, a unique salt value and the resulting hash shall be stored. So again, L1 is not, let me actually do it in another color. L1 is not actually being check mark here. This is really important when it comes to L2 and L3 applications. And I've talked about what this means in previous videos in this series, so you might want to check that out. Verify if PBKDF2 is used, the duration count should be as large as verification server performance will allow, typically at least 10,000 iterations. So if you want to know more about this, you can go into the other amazing resource from OWASP. So if you want to learn more about uh, PBKDF2, you might want to look into the Mobile Security Testing Guide by OWASP, which is available on their website. All right, verify that if Bcrypt is used, the factor the work factor should be as large as verification server performance will allow with a minimum of 10. So this is really important when it comes to password storage. Verify that additional iteration of a key derivation function. Now, you're actually going to do this when it has to do with... So you're actually be able to do this in the source code review cannot do this you cannot know that when you're actually testing when you're actually black box test black box testing an application which is why i highly recommend you learn coding if you want to do source code review because people who do source code review in penetration testing are highly sought after if you want to learn coding 
you should learn JavaScript from a source code review perspective and also learn Java from a mobile uh, source code perspective, Java and React Native. And to help you as a penetration tester, you want to learn Bash and Python are still the most important when it comes to your cybersecurity skills. And I've done videos, I also have courses on this, so check it out on my YouTube and on my other um, platforms. All right, credential recovery. Verify that a system generated initial activation or recovery set is not sent in clear text to the user. Really important for all types of verifications l1 l2 l3 verify password hints or knowledge based authentication are not present secret questions are not present so when you're actually recovering credentials make sure that secret questions are not present so for example you do not have to this would uh, apply in a situation where you go to the recovery let's say you go to forward slash recovery recovery account recovery or something like that and you only have to input your email in there and what this the application should normally do and I'm seeing this in most of the penetration tests, in many of the penetration tests that I'm doing. So what they should be doing when you put your email into the email input field to recover your account, they should first, the application should first check whether or not that email exists, which I highlight, it often does not happen. Whether that M email exists in the database and afterwards, only if the email exists, they should send instructions on how to recover their password or their credentials. And highlighting the fact that in such situations, password hints or knowledge-based uh, authentication, such as secret questions, should not be present. Verified password credential recovery does not reveal the current password in any way. There have been situations when in the user account, I've seen the I, for example, the I icon there where you could look at your current password. So that's a no, no. Verify shared or default accounts are not present. Verify that if an authentication factor is changed or replaced, that the user is no the fight of this event all right verify forgotten password and other recovery paths use a secure recovery mechanism such as time-based otp or soft token mobile push or another offline recovery mechanism that and i have to add here that is not subject to brute force and i think i've spoken in a previous video that brute force ability plus lack of rate limiting so rate limiting issues spill disaster verify that otp or mfa that if they are lost, the evidence of identity proofing is performed at the same level as during enrollment. Look up secret verifier. All right, probably this is the most important. So we're going to fast forward through it. Out of band verifier. Fast forward to it. This is extremely granular. And unless you're talking about a lot of money for highly important applications, such as L2 and L3, 
so extremely granular and if the situation does not involve an L2 or L3 level of verification it is very unlikely you will be getting into that situation one time verifier verify that time based OTP have a defined lifetime before expiring which you can test that in your average penetration test. But you cannot, like for example, verify that approved cryptographic algorithms are used in a generation sending, seeding and verification of OTPs unless you do source code review. Cryptographic verifier, highly applicable to situations when you're doing source code review. 210, service authentication. This section is not penetration testable. So another one not penetration testable. So it does not have L1 requirements. I love this uh, feature from Samsung's notes, the best notes application ever that they recognized. For example, if I draw a line like this and I keep the pen Let me do that again. If I draw a line like this and keep the uh, stylus in place, it's actually going to draw a straight line. And it actually uh, also recognizes shapes. For example, if I do this, it's going to do a rectangle, a square, then a rectangle, then a um, circle, and so on and so forth straight lines and I just can not delete all of them like that so service authentication this section is not penetration testable like I said however if used in an architecture coding or secure code reviews please assume that software such as Java Keystore JKS is the minimum requirement at L1 clear text storage of secrets in 2022 is not acceptable under any circumstances? All right, so this is the end of section number two, and we have a list of awesome references here provided by OWASP, mostly going to NIST and other OWASP testing situation, testing um, OWASP, other OWASP resources. Now, in the next one, we're actually gonna do session management, something that I enjoy tremendously.